sometimes we say that people are in a health state that is worse than death and they would rather die. And that's really horrible. Um, but usually it would be that's something you're stopping them from having, so that's a good thing. Um, and then you multiply that by the quantity of life that they're having in years. So for example, these two things both equal one quality. So you could either have two years at 50% quality of life or one year at 100% quality of life. And as far as most decision makers in the NHS are concerned, they're kind of equivalent. So if we just look at preventing bowel cancer, what does that mean in terms of qualities? Well, you're avoiding the drop in quality of life because people aren't getting cancer, they're not having to have chemotherapy, they're not having surgery that leaves them with certain uh, loss of particular functions or other things. And you're also avoiding the reduction in their life expectancy because you're avoiding their death from bowel cancer, which is would have probably come earlier than they would die from other things. So you multiply those together, and overall you're avoiding a quality loss. So the health service says, this is something we want to do, but it's got to be cost effective. Um, and here we have some cocoa beans, because economists and health economists get called bean counters. I don't count beans, but um, there are some beans in there. <laughs> Good. If you don't call me a bean counter and you've never heard the expression, that is a really weird slide for me to put. <laughs> I'm going to move on. <laughs> Why? Why do people talk about cost effectiveness? And this is a question that people people ask, and it, it's really it's an emotional subject. And you get people saying, "How can you put a price on somebody's life?" And I, nobody wants to. But the NHS budget is more or less fixed. And we want to maximise the amount of good that the NHS does. And normally we say, well, we want to give the most qualities when you add them all up. There are a few other considerations, but generally you want to maximise the good that it does. If you have a new drug or a new programme, it's probably going to need more money. And that money has to come from the existing budget. So that means that something else has got to stop. Another patient is not going to receive something so that you can. You don't have to know who that patient is. You probably never will know. The question is, are you just robbing Peter to pay Paul? Is that an acceptable thing to do? And then the answer is, well, maybe if Paul uses money better than Peter does. So... <laughs> We usually assume that the NHS disinvests or sells qualities for £20,000 to £30,000 per quality adjusted life year. That's probably an overestimate. The NHS is not as good at disinvesting as that. It's probably more like 13000 maybe up to 18000 But you don't need to worry about that because nobody wants to confront that problem. <laughs> so if you've got a new treatment and it results in one extra quality, then it's going to cost less than £20,000 20 to £30,000 extra if it's going to be cost effective. Otherwise, to get the money to buy that one quality, you're going to have to lose more than a quality from elsewhere. So that's why it's important that things are cost effective, because otherwise the NHS is just playing a losing game. And every time it says yes to something new, it's doing net detriment. It's giving benefit to some patients, but it's taking more away from others. Uh, just to be clear about uh, the costs that we're including, so it's only the costs that fall on the NHS and the personal social services. So here are some examples that it doesn't include. Cost borne by the patient. If it costs you to travel to go to hospital, NHS doesn't care. Well, the yeah. They do. NICE doesn't care. But decision makers in suits don't care. Costs borne by the carers or the family if you've got lost earnings because you've got to care for your partner <coughs> or your mother or father. Don't count that. Costs borne by other areas of government. 
So if somebody's out of work and you've got to pay them um, extra welfare payments and they're no longer paying tax into the government, don't count that. And we also don't count the sort of costs that are borne by society, so the lost productivity. So a lot of stuff doesn't get counted, and you might think that's a problem. And in some ways it is, but you can also argue it's the NHS's money, it can spend it on what it wants. Um, and whose benefits? It's usually only the direct health benefits for patients and carers. And it's it's the health benefits that we're particularly talking about. So there might be a benefit to you like, I, I feel more empowered, but if they can't measure that in terms of, well, you're less anxious, or you, know, you don't have depression, or it's got to be measured and classed as health for it to count. Um, yeah, so in summary, if a new program costs more money, it usually has to produce more health benefits than what it's displacing. Not everything which increases health is cost effective. I could be standing here and saying, this thing would help you, but it's not affordable. It could be. If something isn't cost effective, it's unlikely to happen. It's hard to convince people that they should pay for something when it's not cost effective. Because they've got lots of other people saying, pay for our thing, which is cost effective and you're arguing your, your corner. Sometimes there are things that you can do to optimize so that you can improve the cost effectiveness. So if you only introduce it for patients who are gonna benefit the most, then that improves cost effectiveness. So that's why uh, the brief said, let's only look at people aged under 50 years, because they're the people most likely to have Lynch syndrome. They're the people who are likely to get the most benefit from preventing cancer. Uh, it's going to be easier to make the case for something to be introduced if it's cost effective. <coughs> the question is, whose job is it to work out if it is cost effective? In this case, it ended up being my job, but only because of Ian and various other people. Because um, there's no pro profit motive here. Nobody here, there's no company that's manufacturing, you know, Lynch drug for people with Lynch syndrome that makes money when you get identified? Aspirin. Aspirin. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody makes any money selling aspirin. <laughs> well, what's, anyway. Um, and then, <laughs> I'll answer that later. <laughs> yeah, who then makes this decision? Because I spoke to the National Screening Committee and I said, are you gonna do this? because we've done some research. And they said, it's not what we do. We don't screen for risk factors, we screen for cancer. So they're not interested. NICE doesn't seem to be interested. You've got to find somebody to convince to make this decision. And if you can say it's cost effective, it's going to be easier to convince people. So we did some research. We were commissioned. That was the question you've already seen. I'm going to skip through a bit. Our approach was to look at the scientific literature. We didn't get to do any sort of fresh research with real patients, so this is the first time I've met people with Lynch syndrome. Um, knowingly. Knowingly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, yeah, percentages, more of averages. Um, and then we constructed a mathematical model to predict the costs and outcomes of different strategies for systematic testing for Lynch syndrome. Uh, the tests that we offered in the model to these hypothetical people uh, were the tumor tests that Ian was talking about, um, DNA mutation tests, and also the tests for the relatives if you manage to find the mutation. And then these hypothetical patients were offered colonoscopy and they were also offered um, the prophylactic hysterectomy and bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy. So that's to reduce the risk of bowel cancer and to pretty much eliminate the risk of gynecological cancers. They didn't all take it up. Uh, we didn't include offering 
surveillance for the other cancers. So we didn't include um, gynecological cancer surveillance because we couldn't find evidence of its effectiveness. Uh, and you need to know how effective something is to work out whether it's cost effective. Um, and we didn't, this was a tough one, we didn't include aggressive surgery for bowel cancer. Some people say you should, it didn't really make much of a difference, fortunately. Uh, and we didn't include aspirin because that will happen quite late in the day as far as we were concerned and it didn't sort of show up in our literature review. Um, we modelled bowel cancer and endometrial cancer. We didn't model uh, ovarian cancer or gastric cancer or all the other ones. There we go. Results, that's kind of what you're more interested in. Um, systematic testing using tumor tests is cost effective. Okay, so when you are compared to other things that NICE says yes to, that the NHS does, you are considered cost effective doing this systematic testing in people with bowel cancer under 50 years old. For the original patient, if they have Lynch syndrome, it increases their life expectancy by about 1.4 years. Previously, we weren't sure there was really much that you could do for those people once they already had cancer. And some people thought, well, it's not going to be cost effective unless you can test their relatives. We actually found even if there's no relatives to test, it's still cost effective to test them if they want it. And coincidentally, I, I keep double checking the numbers, um, but it also increases the life expectancy for their relatives by 1.4 years if they have Lynch syndrome. Uh, we found that going straight away to the genetic testing was not cost effective at current prices of genetic tests. But if they come down, then it could be cost effective. Can I ask what cost you have for the genetic tests? Right. Ooh, I, yes, I can answer that, Angela. Yeah, we took uh, a median of UK genetics laboratories tests and we factored in something which other studies haven't done, which is the proportion of time that you find a mutation that you can use. Yeah. Yeah, not just the, oh, <coughs> the coin fell on its edge and we don't quite know what to make of it. Yeah, so we, which reduces, it, it errs on the side of conservatism, yeah, every time you do that. Um, and we factored in the fact that you'll do MLH1, MSH2 and MSH6 and only proceed to PMS2, which is technically difficult, in selected cases. Mm -hmm. So we factored all that in and that that costs a bit more than those three. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I think it was about, off the top of my head, about £600 to do yeah, the three that, that order package. Yeah. But the actual cost didn't make a huge difference to the end analysis. Mm -hmm. But it was too much. Huh? Yeah, if, if, you, yeah. if you could halve the overall cost of doing the direct yeah. genetic mutation testing, then it would be cost effective. So, yeah. So you think at 300, 450? About 300, yeah, for the under Um I can mention that on a stand up later. <laughs> So some people might say, well, if you're only looking at people aged under 50, you're going to miss a lot of people. Why don't you look at everybody or look at people aged under 70? So we did. We looked at testing people up to age 70, and it becomes less cost effective. Uh, because you have greater costs and less benefit on average. It is still cost effective. But... Because there's inherent uncertainty, and it's less clear that it's cost effective for the age 70. So it's kind of, for the age 50 people, it's pretty clear this is cost effective. For age 70, you might make slightly different assumptions and you might get a different answer. It affects many more people, so it's almost a factor of 10. Lots more people have bowel cancer between age 50 and 70 than have it under age 50. And a greater proportion of them won't have Lynch syndrome. Um, but we did find that if you just wanted to look at the total net health benefit, it would be more beneficial to test in people aged up to 70 than in people aged up to 50. 
So even though it's less cost effective, because it's lots more people, in total you can get more benefit. <coughs> it's a bit difficult to wrap your head around, even for me sometimes. So you might ask, well, what about having no age limits and testing all bowel cancer patients? <coughs> we ran out of money and time. We don't know. Because <laughs> <laughs> even your time is costed. Might. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what about testing people with other cancers, such as endometrial cancer? The, uh, again, we ran out of time and money, so we don't know. We'd like to know, you'd like to know. So thank you, and I'm going to return to Ian. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Tristan. Got a question in the corner. Question Ian, sorry. Sorry. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if the specific ISO. The specific ISO. Roughly. Yeah. So if you look at doing, I think it's IHC, immunohistochemistry, chemistry, is your tumor test. Yeah. Uh, the ISO was between five and six thousand pounds per poly for the under fifties. Uh, this is this is all published in the Health Technology Assessment Journal. You can download it for free. There's a plain English summary and there's an executive summary. Um, we ended up having sort of eight different strategies. Uh, so it might be a bit difficult to know which one to look at. It's number five. <laughs> it's, it's published a few years ago. Uh, it was published last year? Last year. Yeah, last year. Okay. Last year. It's published last year. It's online. It's 458 pages, if you want to print it. But the, page, the plain English summary is 50 but, words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but basically, we have cased the joint. You can argue with little bits here and there, but when I slap the likes of that on the table of people in suits, as Tristan puts it, I have had nobody argue with that underlying bit of work. It's not a question of whether we do it, it's how do we do it. I'll come on to explain that. But that was my whole ethos with having been wound up at the turn of the century by being told, this is too expensive to do. And I thought, I'll get back at you. I'll prove this is well worth doing. Question. Is, is it possible to put into the argument about cost effectiveness that you can So if we can avoid that, it will pay for the testing. Yeah, it fuels itself in a sense. Because if there's at least 55,000 people walking around, we really should be having colonoscopies every one to two years, then why is that number just being sort of, you know, okay. shrugs of shoulders? That, that helps with the argument, but actually it comes down to beans. Yeah, when I'm in the room. Sorry, Rajiv. I think yes, you can. It's a question of estimating the population impact based on certain yeah. assumptions you can make. Yeah. So you can do that. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll go on to the. <coughs> you mentioned earlier on about testing patients with cancer. Um, if my nephew he died in the early eighties from bowel cancer. Yeah. The age on his twentieth birthday he died. Um, So there's room to test on it. Then there was a family LS. And my youngest daughter was being alive today. Yeah. That, that's the human face of it. Yeah. You know, so yeah. why not? They won't die from bowel cancer. Why okay. not test for it? Way back when, this was classed as a very rare thing. The, weird the weird stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And and we still, we still had his uh, samples of that in 2007, 2008, yeah. and we tested found out that he had the Yeah, we, we're talking about testing of new cases as they come along. Yeah. Testing of cases in the past would happen because of somebody coming along because of a family history. Mm -hmm. So it could well be, for example, that somebody now is identified with it. It goes to clinical genetics because it's been clocked by the pathologist, and then the likes of Angela and her team would want to go and look at perhaps another tumour in the family 
just to get confirmation or to help back up or to find out how it's running in the family, that sort of thing. Um, maybe I should press on because I've only got a few more minutes to, to let you 